Hey everybody, welcome to unit three. We are going to be looking at the cultural landscape today, but within the context of culture. So hopefully you all remember a lot from unit one. Let's continue. So again, one of the main themes of this unit is that cultural practices will vary across geographical locations because of physical geography and available resources. So let's see how this applies to the cultural landscape. So there's two objectives for this um, um, unit or for this part of the unit. So the first one, describe the characteristics of cultural landscapes. Hopefully you guys remember that from um, that first unit. So the combinations of physical features, agricultural and industrial practices, religious and linguistic characteristics, evidence of sequent occupancy and other expressions of culture um, that we can see reflected just by being present in that area. And also being able to explain how landscape features um, and land and resource use reflect cultural beliefs and identities. So this includes attitudes toward ethnicity and gender. Um, it also includes roles of women, um, these ideas of ethnic neighborhoods and indigenous communities. So for cultural landscape, just a little recap. Um, it's a natural landscape that has been modified by humans reflecting their cultural beliefs and values. So think about the human imprint on the, the space around you and what you can see. So this can be made up from different elements such as agricultural and industrial practices, religious and linguistic characteristics, um, evidence of sequent occupancy, traditional and postmodern architecture and land use patterns. So let's go into how we might see each of these. So first, go ahead and take a moment to pause the video. Which one of these does not belong? Go ahead and pick one, write that out in your notes, and make sure you say why. So what are cultural landscapes? First, let's talk about sequent occupancy. So sequent as in sequence. Um, so think about occupants or people that live in an area in a sequential order. So this is the idea that societies or cultural groups leave their cultural imprints when they live in a place, each contributing to the overall cultural landscape over time. Most cultural landscapes are a mixture of historic and modern structures. So basically previous occupants of an area um, left their cultural landscape imprint, and that is something that we can still see today, basically evidence of the previous people or society who lived there. So here in this example, we have the Great Pyramids. Why do you think this is an example of sequent occupancy? So look at the three different images here. Each has um, the Great Pyramids included. Why would this be an example of sequent occupancy? So um, moving on, attitudes toward ethnicity and gender are also part of cultural landscapes, or we can see evidence of this within cultural landscapes. This includes the role of women, um, something called gendered spaces and ethnic neighborhoods. And all of these help shape the use of space in a given society. Um, but first, let's define ethnicity. So ethnicity is a sense of belonging or identity within a group of people bound by common ancestry and culture. This is different from race, which is based on physical characteristics. So ethnicity is cultural. Race has to do more with your physical characteristics. So this first one, ethnic neighborhoods or um, ethnic enclaves. These are people of the same ethnicity that cluster together in a specific location, usually within a urban area. So this is one way that we can see ethnicity in the cultural landscape. This can include language. So you'll see signs of um, that particular language within that area, um, or maybe hear it as people are walking by or living in that space. We also might see some religious imagery or buildings like temples or churches. Um, we'll see restaurants that maybe specialize in that particular uh, ethnicity's food specialty stores that sell items for that relate specifically to that ethnic group uh, or maybe that have items from their home country and different markets. 
So this has connections to chain migration, this idea that when people move from one place to another place, others might follow. Um, that's because it's much easier to be able to transition into a brand new area if you have others that um, are helping you out or can give you information. So why do these form? Um, sometimes these ethnic neighborhoods or ethnic enclaves form as a response to racism and discrimination um, historically uh, with different ethnic neighborhoods or ethnic enclaves, we've seen um, the host population not um, take very kindly to these um, new immigrants uh, for various reasons, whether it's because of racism or because um, they're just anti-immigration. So they tend to cluster together. Um, also, it's a way to maintain cultural identity. It allows them to continue to speak their language, to practice their religion, um, to have access to their foods and to to continue their cultural norms within a foreign place. So in this example here, we have Chinatown. This one happens to be from Chicago, um, but this is something that we see in uh, many urban areas throughout the world where we have Chinatowns or other um, types of ethnic neighborhoods. So ethnic patterns, um, there's oftentimes a predictable distribution of ethnicities that can be examined at multiple scales. So everything from local to more global. So one example has to do with the United States. Historically and contemporarily, so even now, there are clusters of ethnic groups in specific regions. Um, some of this has to do with chain migration. Uh, some of this also has to do with geographic location. So if we think about the American Southwest, we see a lot of Latin Americans, right, myself included, from the border of Texas, Mexico. And also we see more Native Americans present in that area. Um, so that has to do with proximity, geographic proximity. Uh, we also in the Southeast see more African-Americans that's rooted in a more historical um, context dealing with the Atlantic slave trade as the United States um, before that was uh, outlawed, right before slavery was outlawed. And then in the West, we see way more Asian-Americans, again, having to do with geographic proximity to Asia. So this is one example here, um, again, just using Chicago. And here we see um, different colors indicate the different ethnic enclaves that are present within the metro area of Chicago. And role of women. So in traditional cultures, um, we see the role of women is to be to have children, to have place in the home, um, and to not be within education or higher education or in the workforce. So think about like the lower demographic transition model stages, like stage two, stage three. But as countries become more economically and socially developed, women begin to have access to more education, the workforce, um, various rights, including property rights. So how do we see that idea reflected in cultural landscapes? Um, so think about whether women own properties or businesses, how that would affect the cultural landscape, maybe the types of businesses um, that we might see out there. Are women present in colleges? And what does this mean for women's dorms? And are there women working outside of the home? How would that look? How could you tell um, by being able to observe the cultural landscape? So this is one example here, property rights in law and practice for women. Um, so this is a global snapshot. And here we see that um, more green means that there are there's um, less discrimination that is, it says, codified into law and practice follows law, meaning that by law, um, there's no discrimination and in practice, there is no discrimination. So for instance, um, no discrimination is codified or no discrimination is present in law, but practice, um, the reality is that sometimes there is discrimination um, by gender, right? So then, of course, um, going down into the red, significant discrimination is codified into law, meaning that women do not have the same rights according to law, and that practice, what people actually do, is in line with that. So you can pause the video here and take a nice look at this. All right, gendered spaces. Um, so that is kind of what it sounds like. So these are places in cultural landscape utilized to reinforce or accommodate gender roles for men and for women. 
Um, so one example is um, these buses in Mexico City. So um, in Mexico City, only 19% of women surveyed reported that they feel very safe in taxis, um, that should say taxis, buses and the subway that they use daily. Um, so in terms of being a gendered space, it is not a um, it is not a safe place for women in general. Um, nine in 10 women have experienced violence in public transport. Um, so in terms of a gendered space, that is not um, considered a, a, a safe place for women. It's more male dominated. Um, a couple of other examples, hair salons and barber shops, right? The purpose is the same, right? You're getting a new haircut, you're cleaning yourself up. Um, how do we see that these are gendered spaces? One leans more toward women, the other one leans more toward men. How can we see this through just looking at this cultural landscape of these two different types of shops? And finally, land use patterns. Um, so these are seen uh, when the cultural landscape reflects the cultural values of the people living there. So let's take a look at one example, terrace farming. We see this practiced in um, different parts of Asia and Latin America. And that has to do with the way that the geography is, and it's a practice of cutting into steep areas or into mountainsides um, to have a flat area or a terrace um, in order to, to use it for agriculture or to make it arable. So we see this with rice farming quite a bit, but also with other crops. So this is one way that these cultural um, norms and, and values is reflected through land use. Another example um, has to do with indigenous land use, um, looking at the US reservation system. Um, back in 1830, there was the Indian Removal Act and that forcibly removed indigenous people from their land in order to make space for American expansion, right? Um, it's also called the Trail of Tears. It was pretty awful um, to say, to put it um, kindly, right? Um, so here we see the US government establishing various reservations where plots of land in which tribes were forced to relocate and live. So again, that shows you about the um, cultural norms and values of the US government at this time. And people can argue even into now, because this is still the case um, where in, indigenous people were not seen as um, valuable and uh, were forced to migrate through this and, and kind of just herded into to specific areas. So we see this um, throughout different parts of the US. Also another indigenous land use example, um, subsistence whaling. So some indigenous tribes, some Inuit tribes um, in Northern parts of Alaska and Canada rely on bowhead whale as a food source. And it's also part of some of their cultural practices. So there's an annual hunt to harvest whales, which are then divided up among the members of that community. Um, that idea of having a few people hunting and then sharing that with their community um, reflects that cultural value of collectivism, right? Of being able to provide for the group. Um, also ideas of sustainability uh, as well. They use all parts of that whale and um, demonstrates a way that knowledge is passed through generations. So by taking the younger generation on these hunts, and then also after these hunts, how to use um, the different um, parts of the whale for consumption or for other traditional practices is also a way that you pass information. Um, shifting over into architecture uh, of the cultural landscape. One example is traditional architecture. So this is influenced by the environment and built with available local material. This reflects history, this reflects culture, and ultimately climate um, and the physical geography around this culture. So here we have three examples um, in different parts of the world. And as you can see, each one is using um, elements of their environment for this traditional type of architecture. Postmodern architecture 
We do see some diverse designs um, that can be representative of pop culture, um, business and economic success. So think about skyscrapers. There are some absolutely distinctive skyscrapers around the world, uh, but ultimately they're made from the same types of materials. Um, and we do see some ideas of like placelessness, but ultimately um, some places have very distinct and, and unique designs. So just a little recap, make sure you can describe the characteristics of cultural landscapes and understand that um, this includes physical features, agricultural fe features, um, industrial practices. We see this through religious and linguistic characteristics, um, also through sequent occupancy. And also um, attitudes toward ethnicity and gender are reflected in um, cultural landscapes, uh, as well as ethnic neighborhoods and indigenous communities.